Now it is time for the last word with Lawrence O'Donnell. Good evening, Lawrence. Good evening, Alex. We have a couple of Supreme Court experts with us tonight. Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, who I'm always taking notes when he speaks. And of course, Neil Katyal is going to join us on that presidential immunity claim Donald Trump is pushing at the Supreme Court. Over to you, SCOTUS, April 25th. I'll Here be watching. Go. Thank have you, Alex. Show. Thank you. Well, it's not Donald Trump who did this. It's the 63 million people who voted for Donald Trump and put the power of Supreme Court nominations in Donald Trump's hands for four years. And it's the 62 million people who voted for George W. Bush or who volunteered for his campaign or who helped out in any way, which meant that they indirectly voted for Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Samuel Alito, who wrote the opinion overturning Roe versus Wade. And it's the 49 million people who voted for George H.W. Bush, who indirectly voted for Clarence Thomas to serve on the Supreme Court, where he waited for decades to vote to overturn Roe versus Wade. Now, many of those Republican voters did not mean for this to happen. Most voters had every right to suspect that Donald Trump's position on abortion as a presidential candidate was just political posturing. He wasn't the first. George H.W. Bush and the Bush family were supporters of Planned Parenthood until George H.W. Bush had to change his position in 1980 in order to become Ronald Reagan's vice presidential running mate. An act of ultimate cynicism in politics. No one working in American politics believed that George H.W. Bush from Connecticut was really opposed to abortion. It's simply what he had to say to get on the Republican ticket, which in that year was running on an anti-abortion platform that the candidates never emphasized, but made sure that anti-abortion voters knew about. It was the most cynical public act we had yet seen in presidential or vice presidential candidates. The first of President Bush's sons did not have to engage in a public reversal of his position by the time he became a politician running for governor of Texas. George W. Bush fully aligned himself with the absolute anti-abortion politics of the Republican Party that had taken hold by that time in the 1990s. The next presidential campaigning Republican, forced by Republican politics, not by principle, to get in line with the party on abortion was Mitt Romney, who ran a losing Senate campaign in Massachusetts against Ted Kennedy, claiming to be to the left of Ted Kennedy on abortion and other issues. Then Mitt Romney won the governorship of Massachusetts, running with the identical position on abortion of every Democrat in Massachusetts. Mitt Romney was completely pro-choice as the governor of Massachusetts. And then when he ran for president as a Republican in 2012, he completely flip-flopped and became as anti-abortion as any other Republican. So when Donald Trump says, as he did this week, that the Republican position on abortion is just politics, he means it. And he's not the first one. He's not the first one to think so cynically about Republican abortion politics. The last time Republican presidential candidates debated abortion was 24 years ago when John McCain wanted to ban all abortions with exceptions for rape, incest, and life of the mother. And George W. Bush didn't appear to understand his own no exceptions position. George, she's, do you believe in the, the exemption crime. in abortion, case for abortion for rape, incest, and life of yeah, the mother? I do. I do. Then you know it's interesting. You're talking about printed material that's mailed out. Here's one that says that George W. Bush supports the pro-life plank. Pro-life plank. Yes. Yeah. So in other words, your yeah, no, your no, no, position no. is that you believe there's an exemption for rape, incest, and life of the mother, but you want the platform that you're supposed to be leading to have no exemption. Yeah, but Help the platform. Will I will. I will. Thank the you. platform talks about. It doesn't talk about what specifically should be in the constitutional amendment. No, That's it. Doesn't no. have the, the exemptions please let me in finish, it, John. and you know that very John, well. Let me finish. Let me finish. The, con the, the platform speaks about a constitutional amendment. It doesn't refer to what, how that constitutional amendment ought to be defined. George, it does not. John, you read the, the platform. It has no exceptions. John, 
I think we need to keep, need to keep the platform the way it is. This is a pro-life party. Then you were contradictory. May I finish, please? May I finish, platform. please? Right. Please. We need to be a pro-life party. We need to say life is precious. And that's what our platform refers to. And that's why we need to leave it the same. George W. Bush, the man who became president, clearly did not know what he was talking about. But John McCain didn't either. During that campaign, John McCain was asked by a reporter if he would tell his then 15-year-old daughter that she could not have an abortion if she became pregnant. John McCain said, no, I would discuss this issue with Cindy and Megan, and this would be a private decision that we would share within our family. Obviously, I would encourage her to know that that baby would be brought up in a loving family. The final decision would be made by Megan with our advice and counsel and I think that's such a private matter. Yeah, it is a private matter. All responsible people agreed with that answer. But that was not actually John McCain's position as a candidate. And that meant that John McCain was in favor of banning abortion for everyone except his daughter. So John McCain was forced to go into Republican damage control, calling reporters saying, I misspoke. What I believe I was saying and intended to say is this is a family decision. The family decision will be made by the family, not by Megan alone. That clarified nothing, of course, except that Republican elected officials, especially presidential candidates, do not mean what they say about abortion. They never have. They have always been posturing, and none of them ever wanted to deal with the reality of their position on abortion, which we are now dealing with, and the people of Arizona are dealing with tonight, having been thrown back to 1864, to live by a law written by one man who no one elected to anything, back when Arizona was a territory, a half century away from becoming a state. Make America great again now means make America great the way it was in 1864 when the territory of Arizona was fighting on the side of the Confederacy in the Civil War to preserve slavery in America and imposing laws on women and doctors and nurses that everyone in Arizona has to live with tonight. The Democrats in the state legislature in Arizona tried to repeal that law today and the Republicans blocked it. And so the Republicans in Arizona actively made the decision today that the people in Arizona must live as if it were 1864 and it wasn't even a state. And so reporters can and should hound Donald Trump on the campaign trail about the five-year prison sentences that doctors and nurses and support staff and drivers are facing in Arizona now, but you should also stand outside George W. Bush's home in Texas and demand an answer from him. Is this what he wanted when he chose Samuel Alito for the Supreme Court? Or was George W. Bush just playing the game of abortion politics, just like every Republican did before him. The game was never to win. The game was to keep the game going. If you were anti-abortion, you had to vote for Republicans as long as they kept the game going, because they were the only ones who were at least pretending they wanted to stop it. Secretly, Republican politicians didn't want abortion to stop because then you wouldn't have to vote for them anymore to stop abortion. You wouldn't have to contribute money to their campaigns. You couldn't ask for a more powerful lesson in how much your vote matters and how long your vote matters. Your vote lives after you, long after you. Millions of people who voted for George H.W. Bush and who therefore voted for Clarence Thomas to be on the Supreme Court to overturn Roe versus Wade are now dead. Millions of those voters have been dead for decades. Their vote continues to live after them in the hands of Clarence Thomas on the United States Supreme Court. It didn't seem like a life-changing election in 1988 when Michael Dukakis was running against George H.W. Bush. I didn't know anyone who thought the country 
It's going to take a major turn for the worse because of the outcome of that election. The stakes seemed about as low as they could get in a presidential election. But as I've said before on this program repeatedly, whenever the stakes appear low in a presidential election, you always, you always have to remember the United States Supreme Court. And so for the Democratic voters who just weren't excited enough about Michael Dukakis, or the Republican voters who voted for a guy who used to support Planned Parenthood, the truth is that that time they could, at that time they couldn't possibly have known they were going to change life in America profoundly decades later with their vote for George H.W. Bush or the decision simply not to vote. Same thing in 2000 when George W. Bush was running against Al Gore. The stakes did not seem high. That's why ever enough people voted for Ralph Nader as a third party candidate in Florida to give the Electoral College, thanks to the Supreme Court decision, to George W. Bush. Bush, from the Connecticut Bush family, who pretended to be Texans, he couldn't be a real hardcore Texas conservative, could he? The stakes couldn't be that high. It turns out a vote for George W. Bush was a vote for Samuel Alito to take a seat on the Supreme Court and 20 years later, write the opinion overturning Roe versus Wade. And so, yes, you can and should blame Donald Trump, but you should have to blame the people who voted for Donald Trump for president in 2016. And you have to blame the voters who voted for George W. Bush and the voters who voted for George H. W. Bush before that. Because if Michael Dukakis had won or if Al Gore had won, then Donald Trump could have put three right wing judges on the Supreme Court and they still wouldn't have a majority. For the voters who voted for Joe Biden four years ago and are no longer with us, because they were lost to COVID or cancer or other illness, their votes are going to live after them for probably another 30 years that Ketanji Brown Jackson will serve on the United States Supreme Court. Your vote will live after you. It will live in the Supreme Court. Your vote will live on in the hands of federal judges in their 40s, appointed by Joe Biden, who will serve for another 40 years. Your vote will decide what century we live in. Will we live in an age of legal and constitutional enlightenment or will we live in 1864? Your vote is not just about the next four years. The importance of your vote has never been more clear not just as a vote to preserve democracy in this country. We already knew about that. Your vote for who chooses Supreme Court justices is nothing less than an exercise in incredible intergenerational power that will live long after you. Leading off our discussion tonight is Democratic Senator Sheldon Whitehouse of Rhode Island. He is a member of the Senate Judiciary Committee and chairs the Subcommittee on Federal Courts. He's also the author of Captured, the Corporate Infiltration of American Democracy. Uh, and Senator, I, I really wanted to be able to talk to you about this tonight because when I say I'm going to hold up this little chart that you've created that shows the Republican uh, multi-decade plan to take over the United States Supreme Court, we've shown it on the program before. When I say I, uh, people didn't realize, or I certainly didn't realize how big the stakes were in the presidential election of 1988, or the presidential election of 2000. I didn't know about this chart. I didn't know that this plan was underway to take over the Supreme Court in the way that they have taken us, taken it over to now, as we see, at least in the state of Arizona and hope and possibly in other places, sending us back to 1864. Yeah, um, I'd add one detail to your well-told story, Lawrence, and that is that uh, when George W. Bush became president and he had the vacancy to fill, his first choice was Harriet Myers, who might well not have written the Dobbs decision. And George W. Bush was attacked from the far right 
He was attacked by the creepy far-right billionaires for nominating Harriet Meyer as a conservative lawyer who was his own White House counsel. And from pressure from the far right and from the folks who work with that same guy on that graphic you just showed, Leonard Leo, he was forced, humiliated really, to withdraw his own White House counsel's nomination for the Supreme Court and replace her with Sam Alito. So it's not just the people who voted for Bush, it's the people in the Republican Party who tolerate the right-wing billionaire dominance over their party, won't call it out, won't stand up against it, and will let them pull out Harriet Myers and insert Sam Alito and put us on the pathway to Dobbs. Yeah, you know, I've, I've been, uh, since I started this show, I've always been struggling for, you know, how how to teach the lesson of how important the presidential vote is in terms of the Supreme Court. If there's nothing else, if there's no other issue that's moving you, or if you're angry about four or five other issues, you always have to come back to the Supreme Court and say, which one of these candidates do I want making uh, the next appointments to the United States Supreme Court? Particularly when the court has been as weaponized as it has been, and is now point by point delivering on the Republican agenda through cases that have been spun up by billionaire funded litigation groups, through direction that has been spun up by billionaire funded flotillas of amici curiae who come in and file briefs telling the courts what to do, and landing in a court uh, that has been over and over again picked by the Federal Society and the billionaires behind it to do exactly the job of delivering the goods for the far right. Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, uh, thank you, as always, for your guidance on the Supreme Court. Uh, You have taught us more about it than anyone else who's working on the subject these days. Thank you. Thank you. And coming up, 15 historians have filed a brief with the United States Supreme Court opposing Donald Trump's claim of presidential immunity, an immunity he has invented. Neil Katyal and Stanford historian Jack Rakoff will join us next. Seven weeks. Special Prosecutor Jack Smith asked for a deadline of March 18th for Donald Trump's lawyers to disclose any classified evidence that they would like to use in Donald Trump's criminal trial for violations of the Espionage Act. And Donald Trump's favorite judge, Aileen Mercedes Cannon, set a date seven weeks later than what Jack Smith asked for. And so, in an order issued today, Judge Cannon gave the Trump criminal defense team until May 9th to disclose what classified material they would like to use in defense of criminal defendant Donald Trump. And we are two weeks away from hearing oral arguments at the United States Supreme Court in defendant Trump's appeal, claiming that he has something that the Trump lawyers are calling presidential immunity from any criminal charges for anything Donald Trump did while serving as president and after serving as president. A 34-page brief filed with the Supreme Court by 15 historians and scholars of the founding era, including Stanford history professor Jack Rakoff, who will join us in a moment, opposes Donald Trump's invention of presidential immunity, which appears nowhere in the Constitution. The historian's brief stresses five points. First, early Americans held a deep antipathy to 
two, and distrust of executive power. Second, the founders came to the Constitutional Convention determined to create a new kind of executive without the powers and privileges of a king. Third, the framers never contemplated giving the president any role in the conduct of elections or transfer of power. Fourth, the founders were careful to limit and make explicit the law, the, the few privileges that they attached to constitutional offices. Fifth, advocates for the new constitution sought to assure state ratifying conventions that the new president would not be an elected king. The historian's brief goes on to say, quote, there is no evidence in the extensive historical record that any of the framers believed a former president should be immune from criminal prosecution. Such a concept would be inimical to the basic intentions, understandings, and experiences of the founding generation. The crime alleged here of failure to respect the election of a new president is the ultimate crime against the people who are the basis of the government. The president, by constitutional design, should have no role, official or unofficial, in the determination of the people's vote. Immunity for the crimes here alleged would be most abhorrent to the framers because immunity would upset the constitutional scheme and aid a president in overriding the people's power over him. The framers would also have been appalled that former President Trump, despite having left office, seeks permanent immunity. Joining us now is Neil Katyal, former acting U.S. Solicitor General and host of the podcast Courtside with Neil Katyal. He is an MSNBC legal analyst. Neil, uh, in your experience, how does the court treat briefs like this uh, coming from parties not uh, directly involved in the case? I, I want to answer that, Lawrence. But first, I just have to compliment you for how you started the program tonight. I don't think I've ever heard it better said on a news program. Elections have huge consequences, and the Supreme Court has huge consequences over our lives. I've been saying this in every presidential election since 2000, and unfortunately, Democrats didn't listen. But if you care about choice, or you care about reasonable gun control, or if you care about reasonable punishment, or if you care about strong environmental and climate protections, the Supreme Court has outsized influence over our lives, particularly because of life tenure. And I get the privilege of seeing them up close. I've argued 51 times at the court. I've seen Justice Katanji Jackson and what she can do. I've seen what Justice Elena Kagan can do. I've seen what Justice Sotomayor did. And I saw what Justice Ginsburg did before that. And so this is a huge issue. Now, with respect to your question about historians, Bruce, I do think the Supreme Court can take them seriously, particularly when they're as well done as this brief is. Is. I mean, they destroy this presidential claim and they say what it is. This is a claim that the president is not an elected official. He's a king and he's above the law. And there's really no principle in our Constitution that's more anathema to that. And if you have any doubt about this, there was a guy after the after January 6th happened who explained that a president could be criminally indicted. That, that, that person was Donald Trump's own lawyer who said, don't impeach him. You can indict him after he leaves office. That was, you know, one of the few times Donald Trump's lawyer got the Constitution right. Anil, uh, let's let's do jump back to this issue of how voting affects who the Supreme Court justices are, because I think both of us. Uh, over years now have been trying to make this point. And unfortunately, and this happens in human experience, sometimes the lesson has to be learned the hard way. And it does seem like some voters have learned this lesson the hard way in the kinds of turnout we have seen around the country in states when they are voting uh, on constitutional amendments in their own state to preserve uh, essentially the protections of Roe versus Wade. That's right. I mean, I've thought, Lawrence, for a long time about why is it that the Democrats don't care about courts? And part of it, I think, does go back to Roe versus Wade in 1973. We won Roe. And so the right to choose was firmly entrenched in our Constitution, even so much so that it was Republican justices in 1992, Justices O'Connor, Souter and Kennedy, who said, we're not going to overturn it. 
And so the Democrats grew a bit complacent about the court. And Republicans, by contrast, launched the Federalist Society, launched an active movement to try and change the composition of the courts. And, you know, there's two ways of looking at it. One is that's a nefarious plot, the justices are nefarious and the like. The other is this was just the plan. It was a legitimate plan. There's nothing wrong with trying to use presidential elections to change the composition of the court. That's been the tradition of America throughout. Uh, and, you know, we, you don't have to take the first view in order to think that elections have huge consequences over our lives. And if you care about autonomy and you care about reproductive justice, you know, this election in November is as critical as anything that's happened in our lifetimes. Neil Katyal, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. The historian's brief to the Supreme Court says the founding generation sought to ensure that unlike a king, the president would not acquire any special status that would carry forward after the end of his term. Instead, the president would be elected from the mass of the people and on the expiration of the time for which he is elected, return to the mass of the people again. Founding era history provides former President Trump no solace in his efforts to evade the ordinary operation of law. Joining us now is Jack Rakoff, professor of history and American studies and professor of political science at Stanford University, whose name appears, he's, he's on this amicus brief uh, to the Supreme Court. He won the Pulitzer Prize in History for his book, Original Meanings, Politics, and Ideas in the Making of the Constitution. Uh, Professor Rakoff, you are trying to teach the Supreme Court a history that it's, they certainly present themselves as, as, as if they know all of this, uh, but so often they seem to, to uh, veer off in their own historical adventures. Uh, well, it's true, Lord. So all kinds of claims are made about history, you know, often on partial or even specious grounds. And it's the historian's task, uh, whether we, we write as individuals or collectively, as, as we do in this brief, to come up with the somewhat more complicated, richer, but also more accurate explanation of what was the mental world that the framers of the Constitution occupied and how did they think about executive power uh, in the way that they did. And so it's, it's basically our task to, to get the historical record out there so both uh, the justices, but also the American body politic, you know, the, the you know, educated, intelligent citizens will understand the richness of that history uh, and therefore will be better able to recognize the speciousness of, of the claims pending in, in the current litigation. You have, as a historian, uh, debated with yourself and been in debates about what did this mean? What were they trying to do? And, and used your professional tools to try to investigate, to get to answers to that. But in your brief, uh, you say, sometimes history speaks ambiguously, but here it speaks with surpassing clarity. Uh, talk about that clarity and, and how, uh, how valuable that is in a situation like this. I think the clarity derives from the fundamental fact that the, the desire and the concern to limit, one could say, to cap an executive power was the major motif, really a dominant theme in, in both British and American political thinking in the 17th and the 18th century. Uh, in a certain sense, that's what the Glorious Revolution of 1688 and its aftermath uh, accomplished uh, in Great Britain. The American colonists of the 18th century, because of the nature of their dealings with royal governors and to some, some extent the British monarchy, uh, shared those concerns. Uh, and when they started writing constitutions, both in 1776 at the state level and then in 1787 uh, at the national level, the question about what to do with executive power, how to think about it, how to empower it, but also how to limit it, uh, was really one of the main concerns. I, I think it was actually the most difficult concern they faced. You know, we spend a lot of time these days, as you know, as, as your prior segment suggested, worrying about the Supreme Court and the basis of judicial review and the different theories of interpretation. And you know, we spend a lot of time worrying about the partisan gerrymandering of Congress. But the design of a national Republican executive uh, in the 1780s was a truly difficult problem. 
But the one thing that really held the, uh, the founding generation together, both the framers of the Constitution and the ratifiers, uh, was their conviction that the, the, chief, the chief task of the, of the president, as Article 2 of the Constitution says, is he shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed. And it's that obligation, or actually the better term to use here, it's that responsibility, which uh, really underlay the whole framework for thinking about executive power at the time the Constitution was written. So to get the kind of wild claims about presidential immunity from legal constraints, uh, particularly in, in, in a self-serving way, uh, when the Constitution itself and our whole election system gives the president no authority at all over the conduct of elections just shows the sheer outrageousness uh, of the claims being made by, by Trump and his lawyers. Uh, well, he, Donald Trump uh, uh, has really bothered by your brief and has decided to comment on it tonight. So we will listen to this. And I want to imagine, I want you to imagine a Stanford student standing up in one of your classrooms <laughs> and saying this. Let's listen to this. This is not what the founders had in mind at all. This is not what they wanted to think about. This is not where they wanted us to be. The founders wanted the president to have immunity so the president can feel free to make decisions. Uh, what grade does he get, Professor? <laughs> you really, is, is this on a pass no credit scale or, 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 or do you want it on, 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 I, I, on want, the I want the standard yeah. Stanford grading system here. <laughs> well, it's obviously an F. I mean, I, I, I always thought the Trump played a terrible joke on the American people when he swore the inaugural oath. Uh, back on, you know, J January 20th, uh, uh, 2017. I, I doubt he's ever read the Constitution. I certainly think he's never studied it. Uh, he's, uh, he's, he's never discussed it. It's just, you know, it's, it, it's a pathetic situation uh, for, you know, for, for, for so many tragic and threatening reasons. That we have a president who's constitutionally illiterate uh, as well as uh, politically incapable of dealing with the responsibilities of his office. Professor Jack Rakoff, thank you very much for joining us once again tonight. My pleasure. Thank you. And coming up, Donald Trump's accountant, Alan Weisselberg, was handcuffed and dragged off to jail once again today. Adam Klasfeld was in the courtroom and will join us next, along with Harry Littman, to consider what's coming for defendant Trump in a Manhattan criminal courtroom on Monday. Our next guest, Adam Klesfeld, was in the courtroom today when Donald Trump's criminal accountant, Alan Weisselberg, got handcuffed and dragged off to jail once again. In court today, Alan Weisselberg said three words. The judge asked, Mr. Weisselberg, is there anything you would like to say? Weisselberg, no, your honor. Adam Klesfeld's live tweeting of the court session today captured the final moment this way. Weisselberg is handcuffed behind his back and escorted out of the courtroom. That's it. Alan Weisselberg is heading back to jail for perjury during the civil fraud trial involving Donald Trump and his businesses. Attorney General Letitia James is asking for information to clarify if, quote, defendants and their counsel facilitated that perjury by withholding of incriminating documents. And in an appeals court today in New York, Donald Trump's latest attempt to delay the start of his first criminal trial was denied. Jury selection remains scheduled for Monday morning in Manhattan. Joining us now is Adam Klasfeld, who was in the courtroom today and who will be in the courtroom every day for us at the Trump trial beginning next week. He's a fellow at Just Security. And Harry Littman is with us, former U.S. attorney and former deputy assistant attorney general. He is the senior legal affairs columnist for the Los Angeles Times. <clears throat> and Adam, you're in the room with defendant Weisselberg. You've been in the room before, but there's nothing quite like seeing someone walk into a courtroom, a free man, a free citizen, and then handcuffed and dragged off to Rikers Island. What, what was that moment like? Well, Alan Weisselberg was certainly dressed for the occasion, by which I mean he arrived knowing the, the, the sentence was baked in. It was going to be a five-month sentence, and he went into court dressed in loose-fitting athletic wear, uh, dark-colored. You would think that he was already in his prison uniform, although it got a little bit of an upgrade. And so this hearing was two minutes long. And that moment, the reason why I ended that reporting with, that's it. Was That was a pace of it. Yeah. Uh, there was just a quick exchange with the judge. 
he wanted to say as little as possible, and he did say as little as possible, and headed for his second stint at Rutgers. What is the feeling you get from him? Is it a uh, Trump zombie in, in, in his 70s who doesn't know any other way, or is it good soldier, or what, what is the... <laughs> He has been a good soldier. He's been a good lieutenant. And that's been Alan Weisselberg his entire life. Uh, it's not for nothing that this conviction, this guilty plea was for perjury. And if you look at the substance of this uh, perjury plea, it's that he had essentially lied twice about uh, not knowing when the, the when he found out the true size of Trump's New York triplex and that he said that he uh, didn't know whether Trump Trump was present when he had conversations about the size of the New York triplex. These are key issues in the in the civil fraud investigation. This is why Trump is paying such a high penalty, among other reasons. And he held out that information. So this is uh, this. He's paying the consequences of that again. And that's the, and it's a fitting farewell that he says as little as possible in uh, in a way that was clearly uh, to the benefit of Trump. Uh, Harry Lippman, uh, what should the Trump lawyers be feeling tonight with Attorney General James trying to inquire about whether they facilitated this perjury? Depends first whether they did. Uh, you know, there, there, uh, it really was no secret what Weisselberg had done. And it was, it was, um, well known from the whole Forbes magazine article. So will the judge, the judge may, may say enough. We don't have to go too deeply into this. It is just sort of surmise. But obviously he, uh, they, they, Trump lawyers often wind up uh, imitating their client in uh, d dangerous ways. Just quickly on Weisselberg, you know, they say everything Trump touches dies, and this guy has died more than once. He, as Adam says, he shows up in his track pants. He's, you know, just like roadkill, utterly beaten, his, his liberty, his reputation, his credibility, all in tatters because he uh, wanted not to, uh, you know, to be loyal to Donald Trump. What an what an ultimate kind of casualty. And Harry, uh, appeals court uh, in New York today, throwing, knocking down Donald Trump's latest attempt to delay uh, the Monday morning reckoning with jury selection. Another day, another crazy motion from Trump and another very quick rebuff. So, again, it was a single judge who said, I'm not even going to give this to a five judge panel. Forget about it on the delay. We can talk next week about the substance if you think we should reform the gag order. There's no reason to, but we can talk about it. But on your delay uh, efforts here. Uh, you know, in a skinny New York minute, they said, no, don't even have to serve it up to the larger court. Uh, and uh, Adam, uh, it seems like there's nothing now between uh, where we're sitting here and jury selection Monday morning. Absolutely. I mean, we who knows whether Trump is back to appellate court tomorrow morning, but the appellate court has made itself heard three days in a row, mm -hmm. uh, three days in a row. Now, Trump is coming in with a last minute bid to delay the trial, and he gets rebuffed by three separate judges. By the DA's count, he has tried to halt this trial more than 10 times. It's 11 times by the DA's count, and every time it gets rebuffed. Adam Glassfeld and Harry Littman, thank you both very much for joining us tonight. Thanks. Thanks, Adam. Thank you. And coming up, will Wisconsin now be forced to go back to 1849 and live under an 1849 abortion law? Wisconsin Democratic Senator Tammy Baldwin, who is running for re-election in Wisconsin, will join us next. When President Biden and Democrats say they want to codify Roe versus Wade, what they mean is that they want to pass Senator Tammy Baldwin's bill, the Women's Health Protection Act. Senator Baldwin is running for reelection in Wisconsin against a Republican candidate who wants to return Wisconsin to 1849, the first year of Wisconsin's statehood, by invoking an 1849 law that bar bans abortion. And that Republican Senate candidate, Eric Hovde, also seems to believe that you should lose the right to vote 
if you are in an assisted living facility? Well, if you're in a nursing home, you only have five, six month life expectancy. Almost nobody in a nursing home is in a point to vote. Joining us now is Democratic Senator Tammy Baldwin of Wisconsin. She's running for re-election to the United States Senate in 2024. Senator, I first want you to address this thing that we haven't heard from anyone other than this person you're running against, which is there's such a thing as being too old to vote. He believes that you're too old to vote if you need help with anything getting through your day. Can you imagine saying this about your mother or your grandmother? I, Lawrence, I was raised by my grandparents. I was so fortunate to have them uh, uh, stability and their love. Uh, my grandmother lived to 94 years old. She was born before women had the right to vote. When she was 90, she broke her hip and needed nursing care for her remaining four years. She was proud to cast her ballot, and there was nothing that stood should stand in her way. Thousands of Wisconsinites live in nursing homes. Eric Hovde does not have a clue what he's talking about. And if you think about maybe he's trying to uh, prevent older people from voting because uh, he's ashamed of his positions on raising the retirement age and cutting Social Security and Medicare benefits. Republicans in Wisconsin and throughout the nation have tried to make it harder for young people to vote, uh, communities of color to vote. And now we're hearing this from Eric Hovde. He is so out of touch. And maybe it's not surprising. He owns a $2.8 billion California bank. And maybe it shouldn't surprise us that he does not have a clue about the realities of Wisconsinites and their lives. And uh, while uh, he is self-funding his campaign. If people want to help me fight back, please go to TammyBaldwin.com. What is at stake uh, on the issue of abortion rights in Wisconsin in this election? You know, right now we are seeing both President Trump, who recently endorsed Eric Hovde, uh, and Eric Hovde trying to uh, dance away from their position. When Eric Hovde ran for U.S. Senate in 2012 in Wisconsin, he said, I am 100 percent opposed to abortion rights. And now we're seeing both Trump and Hovde dance around. Of, should the states uh, decide or should the federal government decide? Well, I want women to decide. And that's exactly what I'm fighting for with the Women's Health Protection Act. And uh, as we go forward, uh, the, the possibility of codifying, as we say, putting into law Roe versus Wade is only possible if the Democrats win the House of Representatives and the Democrats win the United States Senate and if the Democrats win and retain the presidency? Without question, that is the fact. And when you look at, again, my opponent, who is 100 percent opposed to abortion rights, even though he's trying to tap dance around that, women in Wisconsin will not forget the woman who bled for 10 days before she could get care, the woman whose water broke at 17 weeks and faced the risk of sepsis before she could get care. We have three out of 72 counties where there is any care available in the state of Wisconsin, and we cannot afford to go back to living under that 1849 law. And it will take voting and uh, making sure that uh, I win and continue to be the champion of the Women's Health Protection Act in order to get this across the finish line. Senator Tammy Baldwin, running for re-election in Wisconsin, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much, Lawrence. Thank you.